Okay, and welcome to Unit 2 in Oceanography. We're going to talk about the origins. Origins of our universe, origins of our planet, origins of our ocean, and origins of life. And we basically are going to start way back in about 14 billion years ago, 13.8 billion years ago when we had a Big Bang, and that's when time basically starts, as well as mass basically starts, and it's cooled off and uh, actually organized itself since. Around 3.6 billion years ago, we have an Earth forming, a solar system forming, but uh, pri primarily the Earth. Around 3.8 billion years ago, we actually had liquid water. The Earth had cooled enough where water could actually condense on the surface as a liquid. And uh, around uh, 3.5 billion years ago, um, this isn't really a great picture of the formation of life because these are like multi-celled creatures, but we would have had single-celled creatures, much like bacteria, the extremophiles, things that could live in uh, places where uh, most life can't live today. We're going to start off with the universe. Um, the universe forms, uh, like I said, around 14 billion years ago. And then soon after that, we started getting subatomic particles, very soon after that, subatomic particles. And then we started getting uh, atomic particles. And we started getting gas clouds and galaxies. And eventually, we ended up with the Milky Way galaxy, which is what this is. Milky Way galaxy is our home. Um, we think of the sun as about two thirds of the way out, one third of the way from the center. Um, we actually have a halo around us, which has lots of stars. Um, has about 200 billion stars in the Milky Way. Um, the nucleus is right there. Uh, we have a halo, which is around it. Um, we have these big spiral arms. We actually think we're a barred spiral. And if you were able to stand on one side with a flashlight, turn the flashlight on, that beam would take 100,000 years to cross our Milky Way to the far side. That's what this is saying, 100,000 light years. And we're about 30,000 light years from the outside, about 60,000 light years from, excuse me, we're about 30,000 light years from the inside, about 20 from the outside, because we're only halfway. Then we have a solar system. Um, light year is what we do, is what we talk about distances. Uh, it's about 6 trillion miles per light year, so it's a very long distance. And then we have galaxies that are actually uh, moving away from us. We know this because they're red shifted. And what red shift basically means is when we look at the signature of elements uh, using a um, spectroscope, um, when we actually see the same lines shifted a little bit more towards the red end, and you can see all these are shifted a little bit more towards the red end. It doesn't mean it's red. It just means that they're more red than they usually are. Then we know that things are moving farther away. And if they're blue shifted, we know, and you can see that they're actually a little bit over to the left, um, more towards the purple end or the blue end, that's a blue shift, and that means they're moving closer to us. So when we look at the galaxies out there, they're actually red shift if we think the universe is expanding. Here's an artist uh, depiction of our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, we have a galactic bar, and then we have these arms that spiral out. We're actually, we think we're on what's called the Sagittarius arm. And if we look out, we can see Perseus, and we can actually see uh, some of the southern constellations if we were below the equator, looking that direction. If we look towards Sagittarius, um, which is out here somewhere, and actually, um, Perseus is really located inside this circle. This is just the Perseus arm. Uh, we can't really get, we can't really see these stars. They're just too far away. So all the stars we see in our night sky are really, 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 really close. But we think this is a barred spiral. Buzz Lightyear, talking about Lightyear, um, we think that there's a speed limit of 186,000 miles per second, and that is checked by radar. Uh, if you actually watched a beam of light for one year, how far would it travel? And the distance is about 6 trillion miles. That's 5.87849981 times 10 to the 12th miles. 6 trillion. At that speed, we can make it around the Earth around 8 times in one second. At that speed, we can actually go from the Sun to the Earth in about 8 minutes and 20 seconds. If we turned on um, the beam, there's the beam. This is actually in meters, same thing as in miles, so just a different unit of looking at it. But one light year is easier to remember than both of these. And a fun fact, if you had a stick that was one light year long and you actually poked it, um, the person at the other end would feel it immediately, even though the light of you doing the poke would take one year to get to that person. That would be really funky.
Now we're going to talk about the Big Bang. This is a picture from the front page. Big Bang actually created time as well as all the elementary particles, the, um, all the things you've heard. And um, all of them are slipping out of my mind, but subatomic particles, things that make up the protons and electrons. I'll show that to you in a picture a little, in a little while. Um, very soon after that, we started getting the simplest atoms of hydrogen and helium. And of the known universe, about 74% of the known universe is hydrogen. Around 23% is helium. And if you add those two numbers together, you get almost 100%. That means that the other 2% makes up everything else in the universe. Stars form by taking hydrogen. And actually, stars glow by taking hydrogen and turning it into helium in a process called nuclear fusion, losing a little bit of mass and using Einstein's E is equal to mc squared, taking that little bit of mass and actually getting a lot of light, a lot of energy. Our sun can also take that helium and actually, in a couple of different steps, convert it into carbon. And that's about as far as our sun can go because of its mass and its gravity. To make all the other elements in the periodic table, we need to get the supernova. And we actually have seen a few supernovas in historic time. They've been going on for you know, basically as, almost as long as the universe has been around. And these actually um, combine carbon and other elements into all the other elements heavier than carbon. And if we take a look at the Earth, we have a lot of things that are heavier than carbon, and we are all remnants of uh, an exploded star. We're stardust. Here's the periodic table. Um, carbon is located right there, so our sun can make it all the way to number five. To make all the rest of these, we need a much larger solar furnace, and that would, that's what we think is the uh, supernova. Um, and again, that's just a theory. Uh, it's the only only thing we've been able to see that it could actually cause the pressures needed to make all these things. But if you've ever had a piece of gold, that gold was not made in our solar system. That gold was made in an uh, exploded star, a supernova. Here's a depiction of the Big Bang all the way to today, about 14 billion years later. And you can see we have a gravity wall, and we have unification, the grand unification. We have the uh, electroweak trans, uh, uh, translation. Uh, we have quark hydon uh, translation. We have nucleosynthesis, where we start making nuclei. And then we actually have matter domination, where we actually do have matter. We have uh, recombination, where we start making the atoms. And then if you take a look at this, this is uh, 10 to the 35th seconds. This is time zero. Uh, and they may say 43 seconds. And we don't really get to a second until we get to here. And then we have a hundredth of a second, three minutes later, 5,000, 400,000, 700 million, 3 billion, 11 billion. And now we actually get to you know, 13.6, 13.7, 13 13.8 billion, uh, where we actually have the universe the way we see it today. Here's another depiction I like uh, actually even better. Um, here we actually have temperature just amazingly huge. Uh, here you have 10 to the 27th degrees Celsius and that's 130 uh, 10 to the 30 minus 30 second seconds away. We don't really get one second till we go here but we still have an incredibly hot universe and it just gets cooler and cooler with time and now we're about three degrees away from Kelvin, zero Kelvin, 15 billion years or 13.6 billion years later. Um, here we actually have quarks and uh, neutrons, protons, um, electrons, then we start getting atoms, we get nuclei, then we get hydrogen and helium atoms, but it took 300,000 years to get that, and then over time we actually start getting all the other elements. We have something called nebular hypothesis to explain how our solar system formed. We started off with a rotating dust cloud called the nebula, and gravity actually started to pull it in, and as it pulled it in it started to spin. Uh, very much like an ice skater, and as they get tighter and tighter, it spins faster and faster. It gets more and more organized as the planetesimals, which I'll talk about in the next uh, section, actually starts coming through there, and, uh, and then we actually have the solar system as we know it now with an asteroid belt and comet belts out here, and um, Pluto, a very funky orbit, um, going way far out and then actually coming in side of Neptune, which is one of the reasons uh, Pluto was kicked out of the planetary table on Thanksgiving, and now it's still on the kid table. So supernova earlier caused the thing to start. Um, we have the sun centered. We had a protostar that actually will become the sun, and we have the uh, 
protoplanets, which will eventually become the planets. This is an overview of the nebular hypothesis, and uh, if I click this, hopefully we'll come to this picture, and you can read this, um, but here's our spinning solar system, and I'm going to go ahead and play, and you can see it's moving in a beautiful counterclockwise direction, um, one light year across. It is a little smaller than that now um, as we condensed, and I think this is going by itself. Maybe I'll step it. And you can see things on the inside starting to go. And they're getting more and more prominent on the inside. You can see the clouds getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And as it tightens up faster and faster, and start getting a sun in the center. And we had an explosion where it knocked out the lighter materials. And I don't know if this is playing or not. Protostar, protodisc, where the planets are going to start forming. And I wish this would move a little faster. And there is a protoplanet, it's called accretion, where it actually moves through and picks up material. And you can see here's the material it's picking up, although it's not really picking it up. And it's called a planetesimal, it's smaller than a planet. But as it picks up material, it gains mass. And there we go. I haven't played this since last year, so... I remember how it, I forgot how it works. And you can notice it's cleaning out its orbit. It's picking up all the material. And then we have a gap in between. Um, in this case, it's going to be a Jupiter sized protoplanet and the rest of the planets. There's the accretion disk where it's actually pulling material in. These are accretion streams as it's pulling material spiraling in and it creates this gap um, which is another thing that planets must have and another problem Pluto has. And I think that's all we've got. Okay, protoplanets. Um, here's a picture of a pretty well-formed Earth, but you can see it's being bombarded by all this stuff. This is how it cleans up its orbit. This is the accretion disk and the process called accretion. Lighter, earlier atmosphere is blown away by solar wind. Um, then we actually get planetesimals moving in, small undifferentiated bodies, making a larger undifferentiated body. And then the more dense materials start moving inside towards the center and the lighter material moves out and we have larger bodies coming in um, as these things come together we actually start getting bombarded by lots of different pieces and we eventually end up with an iron nickel core and a silicon oxygen outside for our layered appearance protoplanet to earth if you take a look at temperatures if you have very hot temperatures towards the center um, towards the core and then it gets cooler as we go out um, this blue line is actually talking about the melting curve. So the blue line is right there. Um, at the surface, the red line, which they're saying is actually the temperature for the Earth's interior geotherm. Um, very little geotherm energy in between it. But if you take a look at it, um, it gets down to a point And where you see these two cross. Um, we have molten areas. And then it goes back and goes back the normal way with the blue on the top. And then we have a solid inner core. And this is how we actually... Um, think we understand about the inside of the earth. So we do have a layered earth. We have a dense core of iron and nickel. We have less dense material in the mantle. And then we have the least dense material up here at the crust, a very thin layer, sort of like the skin of an apple to the rest of the apple. And we have less material, least dense material in the atmosphere and in the ocean, the ocean being the most dense out of these two and the atmosphere being the least dense. If we take a look at what's called the earth science reference tables, we can actually see uh, looking at 
density. It gets more dense as we go down. If you want to actually find the most dense material, it's in the center and the least dense is on the outside. If you look at pressure, pressure increases as we go up. And these are in millions of atmospheres, so one atmosphere, one million atmospheres, we get down to there. And then we have this line right there, which actually um, signifies the outer core, and this is the inner core. This is going to separate the asthenosphere from the mesosphere, and this one separates the lithosphere from the asthenosphere, and then that one separates the core. So we actually do have all these layers. Temperature goes down, there's the melting point. So we actually have the melting point hotter than the interior temperature, and then when we get to this point right here, we actually find out that the interior temperature is hotter than the melting point, and we actually do get a molten outer core. If we look at the Earth, we can look at it two ways. We can look at it compositionally, which is chemically, and we do have continental crust, we have oceanic crust, we have a mantle and a core, so one, two, three, four layers. And we can look at it mechanically and how they act, um, where we do actually get what's called a lithosphere, which is the crust of the upper mantle. They sort of act as one. And then we have the asthenosphere, which moves these crustal plates around, mesosphere which produces the heat to move the asthenosphere, and then we have an outer core which is different than the inner core because it's liquid, even though chemically it's the same, it's iron and nickel, and then we actually go to an inner core. So we can look at it mechanically um, in terms of how they act, and we have one, two, three, four, five layers, and we can look at it uh, compositionally, chemically, where we actually have a crust, a mantle, and a core for three layers. Rocks. Um, we have three different basic types of rocks. Um, they're all made of minerals, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide, I think. First, we have igneous rock. Igneous rock is the only rock that comes from something that's not a rock. It's a molten rock that cools. It comes in lots of different flavors, and we probably was the first rock on the planet because it's the only rock that comes from a non-existing rock. Rocks are defined as a solid, and liquid rock is not a solid. It is made from molten material, either from inside the earth uh, where you can't see it or outside the earth when it gets thrown up towards uh, the, out, the crust and up into the mantle. Uh, it comes in two flavors. We have the basaltic or the mafic brand, uh, which is this area down here. And we have granitic and the felsic, which is this area here. And as you go this way, it gets more felsic, uh, mafic, and if you go this way, it gets more felsic. Uh, rhyolite, rhyolitic rock is granitic rock, and basaltic rock is the basalt, and andesite is the one that's in the middle. I like this rock because it's called diorite. Um, but we have granite at one end and peridotite at the other, and we have gabbro if we have intrusive form of basalt, and we have basalt if it's uh, fine grained, just like we have granite if it's intrusive and rhyolite if it's extrusive. Light colored, light density material, dark colored, dark, darker material. Um, these are made of quartz, feldspar, and muscovite, which are called non ferromagnesians. These are ferromagnesians, which are iron and magnesium, which are denser material. And as you can see, we get more and more denser material until you get to this end. It's almost all heavy stuff, just like this end is almost all light stuff. Composition of rock. Um, so we have all the way down here zero ferromagnesium and 100 uh, non ferromagnesium. Felsic, mafic, intermediate, ultra mafic, intrusive, extrusive. Um, and if we get it, we were talking about geology or earth science, we would deal more into this. Um, pretty much with oceanography, we're going to deal with this section right here. This makes up the ocean floor, and this is right underneath the ocean floor. And we'll talk pretty much about these, um, unless we talk about volcanic islands, uh, seamounts, guyots, uh, hot spots. Um, but that still is pretty much this type of this rock. Then we have sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rock is any time you take a pre-existing rock and you weather it, which means rip it to pieces or dissolve it, and then erode it, which means moving it from one place to another. It can be moved in a liquid form. But any way you look at it, we have to get it lithified, turned back into rock. And the two basic types of rock, sandstone, which forms right along the beaches, and limestone, which forms actually in the ocean. And if you want to actually watch, talk about some of these clay particles all the way to gravel, if you want to see boulders and cobbles move, as well as pebbles and silt and clay. Clay, if you've ever watched uh, the Occoquan, Occoquan pretty easily can move uh, some of this material right here. It keeps this in suspension longer. That's why it looks like Willy Wonka's chocolate. Um, but the Occoquan doesn't really get this end if you wanted to actually see what this end looked like. 
uh, watch this video. This is a river in Afghanistan, I think, and they can hear it coming. And I apologize for the resolution. This is as clear as it gets. And here it comes. It's going over a dam. And look at the size of these pieces. And that's in a, that's in a stream of water. And you can see the water itself has the same color. You can actually see the rocks up here. So sometimes it actually gets a lot higher. So this is a relatively small uh, thunderstorm, probably upstream, and this is a flash flood washing, and it's actually going into a not a really clean river, but it's still carrying lots of sediment, but nothing of the really large type. But you can see that stuff's washing in, and again, larger pieces from uh, storms in the past. And I think I'm going to call it quits there because you can see that anytime you want using this PowerPoint slide. So these are just sizes of uh, material. Usually we, uh, to get the limestone, it's relatively small stuff. Lithification, anytime we take sediment, we either compact it or cement it. If we take a sediment, a loose sediment, and compact it as well as cement it, we actually get a really nice rock. So anytime we cement it with material, not just compact it like a snowball, cement it like an ice ball, makes a much stronger rock, um, even rock that we can use for uh, construction, that process called lithification. Last rock we're going to talk about is metamorphic rock, which means uh, many changes. This is a rock that's transformed. It's taking a pre-existing rock and changing it, usually caused by higher pressure or higher temperature. It can't melt because if it melted, the only kind of rock you can get is igneous. And normally we see these in the roots of mountains. If you take a look, there's granite, uh, which is an igneous rock. We can turn it into a rock called schist and gneiss. Uh, we can take shale, which is a sedimentary rock, and we can turn it into slate, into phyllite with increased temperature and pressure, into gneiss. We can take sandstone, turn it into quartzite. We can take limestone, turn it into marble. So the beach sands into quartzite, which actually um, we can find in the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, we can take limestone into marble, which we can also can find the limestone in the Appalachian Mountains. We can take basalt, which is the ocean floor, and if we start giving it, we start getting uh, xylite feces, which uh, we will talk about, uh, actually we will not talk about. Uh, we can get green schist, blue schist, amphibole, and then we can actually end up with uh, some of the same kind of rocks, uh, quartzites and schists. Um, there's a thing in geology uh, talking about these two types of rocks. If you pick up a metamorphic rock and it is a really nice looking rock, probably is, because that's pronounced nice, and if it's not, it's probably just a piece of schist. <laughs> And there's where I'm going to stop for 2-1, uh, uh, Unit 2, Origins. Thank you much.